Greetings, everyone, and welcome to another Halloween horror movie review. Today, we continue our journey through the Universal Monsters saga with 1936's Dracula's Daughter. Yes, the only direct sequel we ever got to the original Dracula. So let's check it out today on the Multimedia Chronicles. <laughs> Welcome back. So Dracula's Daughter picks up literally about a minute after the end of the original Dracula. Uh, two police officers go down the stairs of Carfax Abbey and find the body of Renfield at the bottom of the stairs. And then they find Dr. Van Helsing and the body of Dracula with a stake driven very visibly through his heart. Now it's interesting to note, in the original Dracula, all of that was done off screen. We saw Renfield fall off the stairs, we didn't see him land. We saw his body at the bottom after. And when Dracula got staked by Van Helsing, we didn't actually see it. It all happened off screen. We didn't see the body after. It's not like now, where they show that very graphically. The stake going in, and the big thunk of the hammer, and blood spraying everywhere. No, it wasn't like that back in 1931. They were a little more understated. So when the police go in and see the body, it's actually a wax dummy of Bela Lugosi. Uh, Bela Lugosi was originally approached to appear in Dracula's Daughter, but he wanted too much money. Um, also, they were originally going to make a story based on Dracula's Guest, which was the originally unpublished chapter of Dracula that was later published as a short story. But uh, Bram Stoker's widow wanted too much creative control over the project. Even though Dracula, the book, had lapsed into the public domain due to an oversight of the publisher, apparently, Universal decided instead, rather than dealing with his widow, let's just go in a different direction. We don't actually need her permission now anyway. So they created an original story, kind of loosely based on certain elements from Dracula's guest and kind of mishmashing it in with elements from Carmilla, a much older vampire story, and adding in a lot of their own original stuff and tying it more closely together with their first movie. So Van Helsing is arrested and charged with murder and he's trying to figure out how he's going to defend himself because no jury is going to believe that it was a vampire and he was doing God's work. But then something unusual happens. The body of Dracula goes missing from the morgue. So we quickly see that the body was stolen by this mysterious, hauntingly beautiful woman and her manservant, and they're setting it ablaze in the middle of a forest. So she's cremating it. So it turns out that this mysterious woman is, in fact, Dracula's daughter. Now... At first I was wondering, does that mean he had a kid that later turned, or is this someone that he turned that he just calls his daughter or she calls herself his daughter? I think it's more the latter, uh, in particular because Van Helsing mentions the age of both of them. He says that Dracula was over 500 years old, she was over 100 years old, so it's clearly someone that has been turned that for whatever reason he made into a vampire, much like the vampire women back in Transylvania, I guess. But she went off on her own rather than having anything to do with her father. Now the thing that's interesting about Dracula's daughter contrasted with Dracula, Dracula was pure evil. I mean, he was an absolute force of evil out only for himself. He was pure malevolence through and through. Now she, on the other hand, the Countess Maria Zaleska, is not an evil character in that she actually wants to stop being a vampire. She's tired of it. She just wants to live as a normal human and live out the rest of her days. Her assistant, however, Sandor, thinks otherwise, that no, you're a vampire. You can't go against your nature. You are what you are. So she thinks that by destroying the body of Dracula, she will be free of the curse. Sandor, her assistant, however, 
does not believe this. And on the one hand, he's trying to convince her of the folly of her logic, but at the same time allow her to discover the truth for herself without unintentionally destroying herself. So he makes sure she gets back to her coffin before dawn and things like that. So she meets and befriends a colleague of Van Helsing's who is a psychiatrist specializing in different types of psychoses and mental delusions. He's skilled in hypnotism and that sort of thing. And she gets the idea that maybe she's only staying as a vampire because it's all in her mind. She sort of takes it for granted that she is. The psychiatrist, who doesn't know she's a vampire yet, suggests that she puts it to the test. So normally, at night, she would go out hunting and kill somebody to quench the thirst. This night, however, she decides to go out and find someone and see if she can not kill them. So one of her pastimes is as an artist. So she sends her servant out to bring her a young girl to pose for her. And I have to say, the character of this, this young girl, young woman in her early 20s, absolutely beautiful, just the purest of innocence and the actress who played her did it so beautifully and so perfectly she was so sympathetic and you felt so bad for her you knew that no matter what the countess's initial intentions may have been you know this isn't going to end well for her and you feel so bad she's so sweet and so nice and so innocent and so willing to you know just kind of go along and be her artist's model or what have you but yeah, you you just know. Kind of an amusing subtext to this I noticed in my uh, reviewing for this review was it also seems to be the story of the assistants to everyone. There's the assistant to the psychiatrist who is this very headstrong woman who helps him out and he's kind of gruff and full of himself and won't have any of her nonsense sometimes, but she's also very strong-minded, strong-willed and knows that he needs her to help with different things, uh, even something as simple as tying his tie. You know, she tries to resign, but he won't let her. And she's like, well, I resign. And it's like, no, you didn't. Come on, let's go. We got something to do. And it's like, oh, fine. Because she knows they need each other in a strange way. And it's much the same with the Countess Zaleska and Sandor. Whereas the Countess is trying to better herself and change herself and not to be what she is, Whereas Sandor is trying to keep her grounded and say, hey, that you know, this is what you are. You can't change what you are. It's not just a state of mind. It's not a curse that you break by cutting off the head of the, the serpent. No, it's what you are. I have to say also, the actor who played Sandor was wonderful in this. He emanated this subtle evil where he knew that the countess was just deluding herself but he kept trying to pull her back like she's playing this beautiful song on the piano and it's like listen listen to the music it's it's a sound of being free and he's like no it's not that is a song of evil and she says listen you can hear wings flying through the trees he's like yes the wings of bats <laughs> it's like, this is a song of life. It is a song of death. And he just has this sinister quality to him where he knows what she is. And she, he's just trying to get her out of her delusion that she can change it just through sheer force of will. Because he knows different. Not to mention the fact she has promised immortality to him. He wants to be a vampire. She, he wants her to turn him. He's just being a good servant until that wonderful day when he can have his own immortality. So I have to say, in all honesty, uh, as far as a sequel to a film, which was a fairly loose adaptation of the source material to begin with, uh, it's pretty solid. Like, I really liked the direction they took in this. The Countess is actually a very sympathetic character. In a way, you feel bad for her. She's not necessarily evil. She's just a slave to her nature, and she can't help herself but be what she is. Uh, she kills because it's what her nature and her instinct drives her to do. Her conscious mind, she's trying not to be like that, but she can't help it. So it's really about her on this personal journey of trying to change who she is, trying to better herself, but not realizing that she's already essentially doomed. I mean, once you're a vampire, that's it. 
There's no changing it. It's not like some legends where you kill the head vampire or the head werewolf or what have you and it breaks the chain of the curse and everybody turned after the fact turns back to normal. Yeah, it doesn't work like that. Once you're a vampire, you're a vampire. At least in this version of the lore and most versions of the lore. I think there's been a few out there where they, they tinker with the rules a little bit, but that seems to be the general way it works. Is Once you're a vampire, you're a vampire. So I found the contrast between her character and that of Dracula to be really interesting. And I think they did a really good job of exploring it as well. Helped in no small part by the wonderful performance by Gloria Holden, who is absolutely hauntingly, mesmerizingly beautiful. It says on the posters, she gives you that weird feeling. Well... Yeah, she kind of does, actually, because whenever she's on the screen, either staring intently at a character or directly into the camera, you can't look away. It's absolutely mesmerizing. I have to give a hearty mention as well to the return of Edward Van Sloan as Van Helsing, who, of course, was the absolutely incomparable Van Helsing from the first film, and I think in many ways provided the template for many Van Helsings that followed in subsequent film adaptations. So it was great to see him back in the role that I think cemented him as a legend for horror fans. So overall, I really enjoyed Dracula's Daughter, and I think it's a pretty worthy sequel to the classic film. Uh, it's unfortunate they didn't continue as a series. It was more just kind of individual vampire films which followed or unrelated ones or the Monster Mash trilogy, of course. Much like The Wolfman, it uh, really didn't get any sequels beyond that. But the two we did get make a very nice double bill. I highly recommend watching them both back to back one night because essentially they're very tightly connected as one continuous story. And I think as this particular interpretation of the Dracula legend, it works very nicely. Alrighty, well that is it for me to you for now, folks. So thank you very much for watching. Big thanks to my Patreon sponsors. Be sure to catch me on Twitch. I stream over there almost every day. And I'll see you next time. Until then, sayonara. <laughs>